Hey everyone, I'm Paul, and I just bought the cheapest Chinese scooter I could find. It was $40. What a deal! Well, not really. $40 was not a good deal. So the story is, I got this scooter from a guy who collects scrap metal for a living, and he got it from a lady who was throwing it away. So there's not much information about the scooter, but what's obvious is all the plastic from the rear of the scooter is missing. And that alone makes the scooter not worth repairing because you can't really get these parts anywhere. And the ignition key is missing. But there is a title, so let's check that out. Here we have a title from California. Jason bought this scooter in August of 2008 and rode it for 6,681 miles and sold it to Michael in August of 2013. Jason and Michael signed the title. Jason signed at the top as the seller. Michael filled it out, but then did not send it into the DMV. Michael did not register the scooter. Looking at the backside of the title with the new registered owner, Michael started filling out the title, but gave up after he filled out just three letters. There is no place where Michael would sign this title and where I could sign it, so there is no way for me to register the scooter in my name. This title is worthless. In order for me to legally operate this scooter on a public road, I must have it registered in my name. Unfortunately, Michael was lazy and the registration trail has gone cold. Now it is possible for me to get a title for this scooter, and I've done this before, and I have a video about it right here. Basically, you have to go to your local DMV, explain the situation, and tell them you have no way of contacting the previous owner. They give you a packet of information to fill out, it takes a long time and it's annoying. So what does one do with a scooter with no title? Well, you have two options. One, you take the good parts off it and scrap the rest, or you can fix it. But do not begin working on the scooter or spending any money on it until you've secured a title in your name because you don't know if it was reported stolen in the past. You don't know if it had a lien on it and belongs to a bank. It would be very upsetting if you put a ton of time and money into a scooter and then had to hand it over to the police because somebody in the past was irresponsible. The right thing to do is give up on this scooter, but that would not make a very interesting video, so I want to at least show you what it will take to get the engine running. Now, I don't think Michael was a very good owner, and I'm guessing he crashed the scooter sometime around 2013, then left it outside to rot for the next eight years. I'll start with an inspection and show you just how much damage each part of the scooter has accumulated. Starting with the front of the scooter, the tire looks almost new. You can still see the hairs on the tread and the lines going across. This is a Pirelli tire. The size is 13060 on a 13 inch rim. Both tires are flat. I aired them up and they lost the air in one day. I think it needs some new valves. Let's start a parts list for this scooter. You can use regular car valves from the auto parts store. Replacing valves usually requires removing the wheels from the scooter, but it's also possible to break the bead of the tire, push it aside, and replace the valve while it's still assembled. Using the cheater method, the valves will probably take me two hours. The front brake pads look pretty good. This scooter has the typical Chinese fake ABS. There's a little piston inside with a spring that gets squishy when you pull the brake lever too hard. The brake doesn't lock up because it's too weak to lock up. It's not a very safe way of doing this. And the fork stanchions are badly rusted. The headlight lenses are foggy. We have a lot of fading on the plastic and the paint is falling off. This scooter spent a lot of time outside. This turn signal lens is missing and this one looks really bad. Let's add turn signals to the list. If I were to fix up this scooter, I would go for a futuristic cyber scooter type of look and I really like these LED turn signals. Installing them would require making some brackets and doing some wiring. I would also change the flasher relay to make the LEDs flash at the right speed. I'm guessing this will take at least three hours. Moving on, this mirror is missing paint and this other mirror is completely broken. Mirrors are cheap and easy to replace. I can do it in half an hour. The gauges have fogged up so bad you can't even use them. Luckily, Amazon has some gauges that look the same. I'm guessing it will take an hour to replace the speedometer. Theoretically, it could be done faster than that, but with Chinese scooters, nothing ever goes as planned. 
This front brake is completely dead. What happens with these scooters is they use the wrong type of plastic and that sight glass on the reservoir disintegrates from the brake fluid. When shopping for a brake lever, the size of the bar clamp is important. Most scooters have a 7 8 inch diameter handlebar and cruiser style scooters will have a 1 inch clamp. This lever is cheap, but you also have to bleed the brake, which can eat up a lot of time. The throttle doesn't feel too bad, but usually this tube will get cracked inside where the throttle cable attaches. Also, I don't have a key. This scooter has a few locking things, so you can buy a set with the ignition lock, seat lock, and lock and gas cap. These parts are easy enough to replace, but you have to get all the plastic out of the way first. Removing a lock and gas cap without a key eats up a lot of time too. I want to inspect the throttle. Take out two screws to open up the switch. Look for cracks between the grip and where the cable connects. This one isn't broken yet. If it is, you can just buy a new set of grips. Let's get the gauges out of the way. I've unscrewed the speedometer cable, and now I can lift the speedometer up and unplug the connector. An impact driver works great to break these reservoir screws loose. And this master cylinder is completely dry. Where did the brake fluid go? This side glass thing feels really weird. It's like it got swollen and turned into this crunchy material. Back to the speedometer. Let's get a few screws out of the way so I can open it up. The lens isn't clear because they used really bad plastic that can't handle being in the sun. You can't see through it at all. You can't polish it out. I have to buy new gauges. Okay, so this is interesting. We have 6682 for the mileage. And on this title over here, it says 6681. Michael didn't really get to ride this scooter much and it was sold for one whole dollar. Perhaps it was crashed by the original owner and dude was trying to fix it up and then gave up. Moving on to the middle of the scooter. The battery is missing. We have a random light socket here. This is gonna be for the brake light in the back. We do have the battery terminals. There's always a power wire and a second wire. That's the ground right there. We have a hose that should be on the engine and some leaves and random garbage. Nice. Let's add a new battery to the list. Amazon has excellent scooter batteries. They're dirt cheap and come already filled with acid, ready to go. Measure the battery compartment in your scooter and check the dimensions of the new battery to make sure it will fit, then buy the battery with the best reviews. I've purchased many scooter batteries on Amazon and they were all good. I purchased a $60 scooter battery at AutoZone once and it failed after two weeks. The battery cover is missing, this cover is missing, and the seat material is really bad. I could reupholster this seat. However, this foam is deteriorated, so ideally, you would get a whole new seat. This seat looks like it's the same shape as the one on my scooter. With a little luck, it will fit. The body plastic is missing on the back, and so is the key. But that comes with an ignition key, so if you buy an ignition set, you also get the lock cylinder for this. Let's take the seat compartment out of the way. Here we have a few hoses disconnected. This is the charcoal canister. This part takes fuel vapors from the gas tank through this hose. The vapors go through a one-way check valve, they get stored in the charcoal canister, then go through this larger hose to the air intake and get burned in the engine. The air box doesn't look too bad at a glance, but if you look down here, the rear bracket is broken off and there's a bracket missing from the front. That's not a big deal. I can fix the air box brackets. Let's add them to the list. Brackets aren't expensive, but will take at least an hour to install. I'll start with an L bracket from the hardware store, then cut and bend it as needed. This hose is the PCB breather from the valve cover, and this hose below it with the plug is an oil drain for the PCB to get rid of extra oil that comes out of the valve cover. This hose goes to that charcoal canister. This hose right here goes from the bottom of the carburetor. It's the float bowl drain. You can unscrew the plug to drain the gas from the carburetor for winter storage. The exhaust is rusty on the outside, but looks pretty solid. The muffler straps look like they're good. And the muffler feels pretty solid. Here we have a bit of a mess with the wiring. This is the idle enricher for the carburetor. That goes there. So this just kind of goes here. 
And then this is the rear wiring. That socket that was hanging out here is the brake light. So that goes here. And then these are the turn signal wires. Let's check the engine oil. This dipstick has liquid going all the way up. That's a bit odd. Let's wipe it off and check the level. On these GY6 scooters, you don't thread the dipstick in to check the oil level. It's way overfilled. This oil is much thinner than it should be, and it smells like gas. Gasoline must have leaked through the carburetor into the engine and filled the crankcase. I have to change the oil before I can start this engine. I'm adding a quart of motorcycle oil to the parts list and half an hour of labor. Moving on, the rear suspension looks pretty good. That axle support looks nice. This back tire is also a Pirelli in a 130-60 on a 13-inch wheel. Back tires wear faster than front tires, but it still looks almost new. Let's take a look in the gas tank. Ooh, I don't have the key though. Pro tip, a drill bit is the same thing as a key. It's a bit slower and a lot more messy though. I got it. Okay, let's take a look in there. And it looks, you can't really see. I'm gonna open it up here. Use a hammer and a screwdriver to turn the fuel level sender lock ring counterclockwise. Let's get that out of there. We have a bunch of rust and no gas. I wonder where that gas went. I think it's all in the crankcase with the oil. I want to inspect the carburetor next. I'll start by unplugging the idle enricher, then disconnecting the air intake and removing the air box from the scooter. Next, loosen the throttle cable nut, pull the cable out of the bracket, and disconnect it from the carburetor. Remove the two nuts holding the intake manifold and pull the carburetor straight up. I also need to disconnect the vacuum hose that goes to the fuel petcock on the gas tank and the fuel hose on the side of the carburetor. Let's take a look inside the carburetor. The float bowl has four Phillips head screws. The impact driver does a great job breaking them loose and it's surprisingly clean. Interesting. There is no dirt or varnish from old gas on the jets. Usually the carburetor will be extremely dirty with the jets completely plugged. This carburetor might be good. Let's take a closer look at the jets. This one in the middle is the main jet. I don't see any writing for the size. This must be the original jet. Sometimes they get lazy and don't stamp the size into these. You can see all the way through it, and there are no deposits. This is the pilot jet. It's also very clean. A little chewed up from the screwdriver, but the hole that controls the fuel is good. I'm looking at the floats and the fuel inlet valve next. Pull the pin out, and the inlet valve is clean. This carburetor seems okay, so I'll just put it back together. Moving on, I want to take a closer look at the gas tank. Four bolts hold it onto the frame. Unplug the vent hose, and it's ready to come out. I didn't see any problems in the carburetor, so what probably happened is this fuel petcock went bad. This is a valve that is closed when the engine is off, and as soon as the engine is running, vacuum from the intake manifold is applied to the bottom of a diaphragm here. This pulls the valve open and allows fuel to flow down into the carburetor. If the rubber in the diaphragm gets a hole, the fuel can leak into this vacuum hose and drain the entire gas tank into the engine. This could be the reason I found gas in the oil. I'm filling the gas tank with water to test the fuel petcock. A few cups later and I don't see a leak. Let's attach a hose to the vacuum port. I'm sucking on the other end of this hose. Nobody needs to see that, so just take my word for it. This petcock is not holding a vacuum. Air keeps going through the hose, but I'm not getting any water in my mouth either. The valve doesn't open, but it doesn't seem like it's leaking gas. Weird. The fuel petcock threads onto the bottom of the gas tank. Let's take it off and inspect it. We've already determined the diaphragm is ruptured and the valve doesn't open. Also, the fuel screen is full of rust. Let's add a new fuel petcock to the list. Unscrewing the petcock from the gas tank is easy, but it takes some time to get enough parts out of the way to reach it. I will also need to get the rust out of the gas tank. Evaporust works great. Fill the gas tank and let it sit overnight or for a few days if you have a lot of rust. 
It will take longer than two hours, but I don't intend to sit here and watch it the whole time. A watched gas tank never gets rid of its rust. Or something like that. I also need to inspect the drive belt and transmission. Use an 8mm socket to remove the bolts around the edge of the belt cover. The two bolts at the back are longer than the others. I'm also taking off the kickstart lever. Remove the bolt and pry it apart with a flathead screwdriver to make it easy. Now the cover is ready to come off. This one was a little bit stuck. I'm removing the kickstart gear because it's annoying and doesn't work very well anyway. The clutch drum is connected through the final drive gears to the rear wheel, and the front drive face and variator are connected to the engine. I'm cheating a bit and using my impact driver to take off the variator nut. I recommend using this CBT holding tool from RollingWrench.com to keep the variator and clutch from moving. You'll need something like this when reinstalling the nut because you must torque it by hand with a torque wrench. The drive face is splined directly to the crank and transfers the torque from the engine to the belt. This belt looks pretty good. I don't see any tears or cracks. Unfortunately, the numbers are worn off, so I don't know what size it is. The variator slides in and out on this bushing and changes the gear ratios in the transmission. One of the plastic bushings is missing and another one is broken. The rollers actually look pretty good. They're still round and haven't developed flat spots. I'm adding a new variator and CBT holding tool to the list. Changing the belt is a good idea too, but mine is still good and I'm only adding things that are actually broken. I want to take a look at the clutch next. Remove the nut and pull the clutch drum off. Here you can see the edges of the friction material are a little chewed up, but should still work fine. The drum has some hot spots in it, but it's nothing a little sandpaper can't fix. And this whole thing just slides off. I'm done looking at the transmission, so I put it back together, minus the kickstart. GY6 kickstarters don't work very well anyway, and as long as you have a good battery, the electric start is very reliable. Let's put the cover back on. Make sure to start all the bolts by hand so you don't cross thread them. Install all the bolts finger tight, then go back through and tighten them. I'm half-assing this step because it still needs a variator. Okay, let's get this contaminated oil out. The drain plug is on the left side of the scooter. This oil is very light in color and the viscosity is extra thin. It's pouring out very quickly because this isn't oil. It's mostly gasoline with some oil in it. It's kind of crazy how much oil is in this pan. There are at least two quarts in here and this engine takes 0.7 quarts of oil. Let's put the drain plug back in and move over to the right side of the scooter to remove the oil screen. It's like a filter, but only catches big chunks of metal. The screen sits on top of the plug and has a spring that holds it in place. It looks very clean. There are no metal shavings or anything. This engine might still be good. Stack the spring and screen on top of the plug and screw it back in. Next, I'm pouring 0.7 liters of 10W40 synthetic motorcycle oil in through the dipstick tube. It doesn't have to be synthetic, and you can go up or down a little bit with the viscosity if you have to. The oil situation should be good for now, so let's move back to the fuel system. This is how the fuel system works. Here we have vacuum from the intake manifold. The vacuum pulls the diaphragm down in the petcock, which opens the valve and allows fuel to flow from the gas tank to the float bowl of the carburetor. Since the petcock and gas tank aren't exactly in good condition, I'm making a new fuel system for this scooter. This sour cream cup with a hole in the bottom will be my new gas tank. Just shove the hose in here and it should be just fine. I don't need the vacuum hose going to the petcock, but the carburetor still needs a vacuum hose going from the intake manifold to the diaphragm on the throttle side. And that's the minimum number of hoses to make the carburetor work. Here we have vacuum to that, and we have fuel right here. Let's clean up the engine bay a little bit too. The scooter doesn't need a charcoal canister to run, so we can take this off and that can come out. The positive crankcase vent on the valve cover also doesn't need to be connected for the engine to run. Let's put the carburetor back in. The intake manifold is held in by two nuts. I'm cutting the little rubber thing off the throttle cable. It just gets torn and causes the cable to get stuck anyway. 
Connect the end of the cable to the throttle cam first, then slide the cable into its bracket and tighten the nuts. Adjust it so the throttle has a little bit of play before it engages. Remember to plug in the idle enricher. It's like an automatic choke that helps the engine start when it's cold. I'm securing my gas tank with some duct tape. It's perfect. I'm filling it halfway up with some gas. That should be enough. Oh no! The gas is going on the floor. That's not right. The carburetor is leaking out of the side. Okay, so it looks like the float bowl on the carburetor overflowed. And it was dumping out of this, which is an overflow. So that means the fuel inlet valve isn't working correctly. As the fuel fills the float bowl, the floats are supposed to rise and close the fuel inlet valve when the floats reach the horizontal position and they are parallel to the edge of the carburetor here. What's happening is this valve isn't closing and the carburetor gets overfilled so much that the gas comes out of this overflow tube and it's dumping gas straight into the engine as well. There could be two reasons for this. Either these floats have holes and they don't float, in which case there would be gas in them, or they're adjusted incorrectly. Let's push this pin out and inspect the inlet valve again. This metal piece needs to be bent down more to close the valve earlier when there is less fuel in the float bowl. Let's reinstall the inlet valve onto the floats and put this stuff back in the carburetor. To test the valve, I attached a hose to the fuel inlet on the carburetor and I'm blowing air into it. You want the fuel to stop right when the floats are parallel to the body of the carburetor. Now that I've adjusted the floats correctly, I can put the carburetor back together. I'm going to check it for leaks before I put it back in the scooter. Here I have a cup full of gas, and the carburetor is not leaking. That's great. This time the gas is staying in the carburetor instead of going on the floor. Now I just need a battery. I borrowed a good battery from my other scooter, and it can go in there with the dirt. Time to start the scooter, but I don't have the key. I need to get the front body plastic off to access the ignition switch and hotwire this scooter. One more screw in the front, unplug the headlights, and the front fairing is off. One more bolt here, and I need to take the ignition switch trim ring off. And the leg shield is ready to come off. Two bolts hold the ignition lock onto the frame of the scooter. The long pin that goes into the steerer tube is the steering lock. Two Phillips head screws attach the ignition switch to the ignition lock. The lock just turns a flat piece in the switch. You can do exactly the same thing with a flathead screwdriver. The trick is finding the on position. So far, nothing is happening. Let's check this fuse. Every Chinese scooter will have a cheap glass fuse for the main power. It doesn't look blown. Let's put it back in. I have 12.4 volts across the battery. This red wire should have 12 volts as well, but it doesn't. Let's backtrack a bit and check this fuse again. The fuse is not letting power through. I'm taking the fuse out and checking power at the wire. I'm seeing a lot of rust. There is no power until I scrape the lead against the terminal. Now I'm checking for continuity. The multimeter will beep when there is continuity. Is this fuse good? Yes. We just have too much rust right here for the electricity to get through. Some coarse sandpaper should take care of the rusty terminals and the fuse. Let's put the fuse back together. I have the black lead grounded to the frame, and the red lead is going to the red wire at the ignition switch, and I'm seeing 12.4 volts. Now I'm moving the red lead to the black wire. This wire should have power when the key is in the on position. Now just turn the switch until the black wire has power. The ignition switch is on the on position. Let's make sure we're on the run here. Hit the brake and the starter. It's clicking, but won't start. And this is the starter solenoid right here. The starter solenoid clicks, but the starter doesn't turn. The starter is right here. I need to see if it's getting power from the solenoid. Let's move back the terminal cover. The starter is not getting power. So it looks like this solenoid's not working. 
So let's jump power across it. I'm adding a starter solenoid to the list. Replacing it is easy after you get all the plastic out of the way. It's still not starting. Let's check for spark. The ignition coil is back here and it is plugged in. Let's pull that spark plug wire, then I'm going to inspect the spark plug. Use a 16mm socket to unscrew the spark plug from the engine. The tip of the spark plug looks a little black and slightly dirty, but it's not too bad. The spark plug gap is very important. Get a gap tester from your local auto parts store and measure it. This one is in inches, so I'm looking for somewhere between 24 and 28 thousandths of an inch. I measured 30, so I'm going to close the gap a little. Now it's at 26. Perfect. This spark plug should work fine. I'm connecting a spark plug tester between the coil and the spark plug. You should see a light if you have a spark. I got nothing, so there is no spark. I happen to have a new coil here, so let's try that. Swapping parts is one of the easiest ways to diagnose scooter problems. Buying a few extra Chinese scooter parts doesn't cost much and can save you a lot of time. The new coil didn't make it start, so I'm trying the CDI next. The CDI takes input from the stator so it knows when to fire the spark plug. It provides the ground to the ignition coil and interrupts that ground at the right time to make the spark. It's hard to test a CDI, but it's very easy to swap it to see if it changes anything. Check that out. This scooter runs! Before I forget, let's add that CDI to the parts list. The stock CDI is cheap. You can also get a performance CDI that increases power to the coil and gets rid of the rev limiter. Okay folks, so it looks like I have a good carburetor, had a bad CDI, I reconnected the old coil, so the old coil is fine, just running off this cup of gas here, looks like the digital thing is a clock, that's cool. The sour cream cup gas tank is pretty awesome, but my goal is to ride the scooter, so I'll go ahead and fix the gas tank. I already have a gallon of evaporust in my garage. This liquid dissolves rust and is perfect for hard to reach places like the inside of a gas tank. You want to give it at least 24 hours to do its thing. It's the next day and I'm pouring the evaporust back out of the gas tank. The liquid is light yellow when it's new and gets darker after you use it. It's reusable too, so just pour it back in the jug. The evaporust will eventually get gross and black, and that's when it doesn't work anymore. Let's take a look inside the gas tank. That's a lot better. There's only a little bit of rust left. That's good enough for the girls I go out with. I used a pressure washer to get any remaining dirt and loose rust out of the tank. The new fuel petcock comes with a strainer and a rubber o-ring. This nut is bigger than 19mm, so it's pliers size. I angled the outlets towards the corner of the gas tank. The fuel level sender goes back in next. Turn the lock ring with the big channel locks until it stops. This new locking gas cap came with the ignition lock set. Okay, let's take a look at this scooter. I replaced the brake lever because I want the front brake to work. I didn't buy new gauges, but I was able to polish them enough so I can see the speedometer. 
I already had the polishing compound, so I didn't have to spend money. The scooter got a new ignition switch and a new battery. I also replaced the CDI and starter solenoid. Back here, you can see the fuel hose coming from the tank through a filter into the carburetor. The hose under it is the vacuum line that opens the fuel pack cock on the gas tank when the engine is running. On the other side, coming from the top of the gas tank, is the vent hose. Fuel vapors go through a one-way check valve, but instead of the charcoal canister, it's hooked up to the air intake here. The PCV hose goes from the valve cover to the oil separator on the air box. I removed the drain hose because it doesn't need it. And finally, I made two brackets to hold the air box. Time to fill up the scooter with gas. I'm hoping it doesn't just spill on the floor this time. Theoretically, everything should work now. The scooter starts, but it's having some trouble with the idle. The idle mixture screw is on the left side of the carburetor. Turn it all the way clockwise until it stops, then back it out one and a half turns. That will make the idle mixture pretty close to perfect. It's idling better, but still just a little low. I have to twist the throttle to keep it running. Turn the idle speed screw on the right side of the carburetor clockwise to speed up the idle. Okay, now it's idling by itself. That's nice. The headlights work, and the high beams work. We have turn signals, and the horn works. Let's go for a ride. The fun thing about 150cc GY6 scooters is they're fast if they run right. This thing just takes off. The handling and suspension is terrible though. It's scary going around turns and hitting bumps, so I have to slow way down. These things are far from what I would call safe. At any moment, parts can fall off, and did I mention this thing is unstable? I feel like I'm sitting too far forward and the steering is twitchy. Let's test the brakes. They're actually pretty good. Going back, this road is a slight incline, so it's a little slower. I haven't tuned the carburetor or transmission, so this thing could be a bit faster. Not that the rest of this scooter is ready for that. I don't think the front suspension fork works. Alright, let's take a look at what I've done to this scooter so far. I replaced the tire valve so the tires would hold air. I have a separate video about that. The front brake was required so I wouldn't die on the test ride. Keys, battery, airbox brackets are all needed to make it rideable. And of course, new oil, fix the gas tank, new starter solenoid, and CDI. I did the minimum number of things so I could ride the scooter and make this video somewhat interesting. I spent $145 and I bought the scooter for $40. I spent 10 hours fixing it. You might have noticed this scooter isn't quite street legal the way it is. To finish this scooter, I would also need turn signals, mirrors, and much more. I'm estimating $200 and 6 hours to fix all the missing plastic in the back. You can't exactly order replacement fairings for Chinese scooters, so I'll have to spend a lot of time making stuff for it. In Utah, registration and insurance are also required for scooters. That adds up to $569 and 12 more hours of work. So let's answer the big question. How much will it cost to ride this scooter to work? I've already spent $185, but it needs $569 more dollars. So that's $754 and 22 hours of work. So what if I spent that time just working my job instead? For this example, let's say you get $15 an hour. You could make $330 working instead of fixing this scooter. Not counting registration and insurance, that's $907. Can you buy a better scooter for $907? Perhaps one that looks better and doesn't need repairs at all? Yes, I think so. That makes this junkie scooter not a good deal at all. If you add in the insurance and registration, this scooter will cost $1,084. It's not really a $40 scooter now, is it? What if I didn't buy the scooter at all and just drove my car instead? $1,084 will buy me at least 154 gallons of gas, and I can drive about 3,600 miles. 
The scooter will probably break long before I can put that many miles on it, making the scooter even more expensive. What I want to point out here is buying a horribly broken Chinese scooter for cheap might look like you're saving money, but you probably won't. We've already determined this scooter is not really worth fixing, so what am I going to do with it? Well, I'll just sell it for cheap and let it be someone else's problem. Besides, I recently bought this other scooter. This is a Tao Tao BWS 150cc. It's a Yamaha Zuma clone, and with the bug eye headlights and the fat tires, this thing is adorable. And most importantly, it's not missing any parts. I paid $400 for this scooter, and it already runs. What a deal! And just like this red scooter, the very first thing I will do is make a thorough evaluation video where we find the stuff that's wrong with it and how much it will cost to fix it. If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so. And remember to check out my Chinese scooter playlist. There are many other videos that you might find useful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.